All right, so I brought in my vectorized line art into Photo P at 11 inches by 14 inches by 350 pixels per inch. It's plenty clean. Sometimes what can happen is that your line art will be CMYK black, which is not as black as RGB black. So the way you fix that is you double, you double click on the layer to get to layer styles. And then you say color overlay. And then you make sure in the color overlay, it's all the way black right there. That's just a, a subtle little thing. But if you're if it looks at all faded or gray, you can do that with effects and color overlay on your vector. Then once you have your vector in and it's sized nicely, come on. On your 11 by 14, make sure it's the right size by 350. We want to keep that as a smart object, something that we will not edit. So we're going to lock it. Select the layer, click the padlock. Then we don't need anything else. We don't need our sketches anymore. We don't need our digital sketch. We don't need our pencil sketch. All we need is a blank white layer that is locked on the bottom and our line art layer that is locked on the top. And there is a certain way to organize your layers for digital coloring. And this is the way. We can call it the digital coloring sandwich has black bread on the top, white bread on the bottom. Already a weird sandwich, right? What's the simplest thing you can do to make a sandwich? What do you put inside two pieces of bread? Something, right? Maybe cheese, and you have grilled cheese. Maybe it's peanut butter, and you have peanut butter sandwich, which is never my thing, but some people love it. All right, we need to make one layer because two pieces of bread is not a sandwich. That first layer is going to be called flat color. Now, this is where things can get a little complicated. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an abundance of options because coloring can do so much. Like we saw in Fabian's mentorship presentation, you know, coloring can make it so that it appears that something is metal or that something is fur or that something is plastic or cloth or feather. But right now, all of that's up in the air because this is just empty line art. So if you go to the assignment, you will see as part of it, I give you a link to some slides right underneath the handout because this is the basic way we approach coloring. We start with what's called flat local color. Flat local color is the color the thing is no matter the lighting. So Charlie Brown's shirt is yellow, right? Charlie Brown is always colored when it's colored with the same flat yellow shirt. It doesn't matter if Charlie Brown is holding a candle in a dark pumpkin patch. That shirt is the same yellow, right? That is what's called local flat color. What is the local flat color of a lemon? It is yellow. What is the local flat color of a banana? It is yellow. What is the local flat color of Charlie Brown's shirt? It is yellow. Now, because Charlie Brown was printed in color, before the 1950s, and definitely before, maybe that's not right, but definitely before the 1970s, there were actually limited options for mass reproducing color illustrations. So I'm going to explain to you a little bit about digital coloring. When you are digital coloring, you are coloring behind real or implied line art. So this always goes behind lines. Sometimes it's really easy to see the lines. Sometimes it becomes a little bit more conceptual, but this will help make sense. This is the process, right? Flat color, then do a tone. But you start with a sketch, then you get clean line art. We're there already. Then you fill it in with flat, simple color right there. And then you can modify that color. Here's another handout. You can get this from the links page in Canvas. And I have it printed here. So we got our clean line art. Now we're going to fill it with color. If it's flat local color, it's always going to be flat, which means it's the same pixel, just absolutely same pixel filling in the entire shape. But if it's local color, it means that's the color that the thing is. So Nico as a little Pokemon, my Nikomon, he is blue and green, right? So 
everything is filled in with one solid color of blue or green. Then you can modify it and eventually get variations. This was the first palette of colors that they used in printing using cyan ink, magenta ink, yellow ink, and black ink. These were the first range of colors that you could make. So all old comics before 1970s were all printed with these colors, right? And that's because they were printed on, on newsprint paper, which was kind of a, a dull gray paper anyway, right? And it was, they were, could only be printed at 150 dots per inch. Into, that's the actual ink going into the paper because newsprint is so fragile. And that's what happened with newspaper comics and all of that. So I'm going to use that palette. I even did a screen grab of that palette. But digital coloring is a little different. You have millions of colors at your option. So your flat colors can be anything. They can be variations on gray. Variations on purple, variations on skin tones, right? One typical way to start digital coloring is this step called flatting. And flatting is exactly what we're going to be doing, and you can see an example of it here. But you don't tend to use local color for that. You tend to use any bright color that's different than the colors next to it. <laughs> and you just fill it in with a flat tone. These would be the flat local colors for Wonder Woman. This is flat coloring for Wonder Woman, right? But sometimes her skin tone's different. But notice that it's always only one tone in any of these examples. And then the line art goes on top of it. It can be very simple. Flat coloring can be all you need as long as you choose the right colors. And that can be hard. But if you can't decide what colors are the right colors, just fill them in anyway with any random color. That's called flatting. This is the more professional way to do it because often the person who did the, the penciling is different than the person who did the inking. That's different than the person doing the coloring, right? And the, the entry level digital coloring job is being a flatting artist where you just go in and you fill it in with these bright fluorescent colors that are all very different from each other. Then the more senior colorist will go in and they'll replace these with the colors they want. Because sometimes the colors they want, and I'm not saying this is not my own work, that this is the most interesting way to do flat color, but look how similar all these colors are, right? But if you flatted it first, that means you could easily get variation wherever you wanted it instead of just coloring it all brown, okay. which this colorist will use later. So this is a good slide right here, the difference between flatting and local flat color, but both of them just fill in the space within your line art. So that's our next step. In order to do my colors, whether it's local flat color or whether it's flatting, I'm going to take that screen grab that I got from my slides. I love these default early colors, and I'm going to shrink it into the corner of my project. Because if you open something into Photoshop, it means you can steal that color, or Photo P, you can steal that color into your foreground color just by using the eyedropper tool. I'm also going to steal the ones I got from our mentorship presentation, this beautiful range of palettes. Some are influenced by different Miyazaki films. But again, I can use the eyedropper tool. I can steal any of these colors and use them as some of my flats. I might also take an illustration I like, something like this, which is not a spot illustration. It's just a regular illustration, but I might like some of the coloring effects they're using. And I might want to steal some of those colors. So I'm going to bring that in. All three of those. I'm going to select and I'm going to merge with command E or merge layers under layer. So they're all just one layer and I'm going to label that layer color reference. This is like my palette to use. Now I can also just make my own colors using the color sliders, the millions of colors here, but this can take a lot of time 
I can use the default palettes, which are actually pretty pleasing within Photo P. But it helps me a lot to just hold Option and be able to steal directly from these ones I have open. And then I can always modify them more if I want. Okay, now I've got my color reference. That's going to be, that's like saran wrap around the Velveeta cheese on my sandwich, right? So it's helpful, but I'm going to take that saran wrap off the Velveeta cheese before I eat my sandwich. That's my color reference. So how do I use this? I'm going to use my magic wand. I'm going to try to streamline this workflow so it's really straightforward. But this is a phase of the project, which is not my favorite phase. It's why it's an entry-level digital coloring job. Um, it's a phase that I call kill whitey. So we're going to try to get rid of all these whites and replace them with our color, right? So what do I do? I've locked my black bread. I've locked my white bread. I'm also going to lock my color reference. So that the only layer I can actually do anything to is my cheese layer, my flat color layer. I'm going to use my magic wand with contiguous checked and a tolerance of around 12. I'm going to go to my line art layer at the very top, my black bread, even though it's locked, I can select from it. And I'm going to select something. In fact, I might select a few somethings that I think might be the same color. And now just to show you what I've done, I'm going to click the eyeball off on my black line art. And you can see if you remember this from compositing, our selection will move between layers. So I have that selection. Now I'm going to go to my flat color layer, and I'm going to use a new tool, which is the paint bucket tool, which you'll find underneath the gradient tool. And when I'm on the paint bucket tool, all I have to do to select a color is hold down Option and then click wherever the color is that I want. I want like a skin tone color pretty generic, you know, Caucasian skin tone, this kind of yellowish peach, and then I can just drop it in. And it will do it. It's just glitching on me. There you go. And that is how we will do our flat color. Whoops, I just clicked it on the background. I don't want that. I'm going to have to close some of these tabs, I think. But what we have now is we have black line art on top. We have flat color as our cheese in between, and then we have the white underneath it. And now I have to do a lot to kill Whitey and get all of this colored in. So I'm going to save my work, just Command S. Make sure I know where it's saving. This would be my PSD. It's saving right there. And now I'm going to optimize Photo P. How am I going to do that? By closing all these programs I have open. So if you find that Photo P is lagging, because we're working at pretty high resolution, close any programs you don't need. And close any tabs that you don't need. In fact, it'd probably be best to close all of them. Quit Chrome. Start again in Chrome, because Photo P works a lot better in Chrome than it does in um, Safari. Thank you. I've always found that it works pretty well in Firefox, but Firefox is no longer supported by the campus. So Chrome works just fine. Now I'm going to open up that PSD file in Photo P, right? I'm going to push the ads off. All right, and now I'm just going to get to work coloring. So it's important to know that you can lock a layer and you can still select from it. So now I can select this muzzle. I can select um, what else is going to be the same color as the muzzle. I don't know, maybe the hair. And holding down shift, I can select multiple things. 
and then I can